Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm State Auditor Tom Schweik, and I'm here to uh, deliver the results of our audit of the St. Louis uh, Public Schools. I wanted to uh, begin the uh, discussion today by explaining why we decided to audit the public schools uh, and then uh, go into what our findings are. And then I'll be happy to answer any of your questions afterwards. Um, this audit that we're doing uh, today and releasing today is part of a new emphasis that our office has put on auditing school districts. Uh, one of the priorities I set when I became auditor a couple of years ago was to audit the four largest school districts uh, in Missouri. And you may know that about two years ago we released the audit of the Kansas City Public Schools. Then we released the audit of the Springfield Public Schools. Then just earlier this year we released the audit of the Rockwood Public Schools. Uh, and now we're releasing the audit of the St. Louis City Public Schools. And that will complete our initiative to audit the four largest school districts. St. Louis City Schools ranks either number one or two, depending on the year. Uh, Springfield was number one one year. The, the enrollment's very close to the same. But right now, I think St. Louis City Schools is actually the largest school district uh, in Missouri. Another part of our educational initiative in the auditor's office was to make sure we audit rural schools, which I will not discuss here today, but we also have a program to do that because we don't just want to do urban schools. And I also started an initiative last year, which raised a few eyebrows, which is also to audit at least one wealthy school district every year. Uh, we shouldn't just focus on the ones that are having funding problems. We should also focus on the ones that are flush with cash because often, you may have a situation where a wealthy school district doesn't feel they need to be as careful with their money because they have so much. So we've tried to be very balanced in the way we approach school district audits, but one of the most critical pieces was to audit the four largest school districts, and today I deliver the results of the largest uh, in Missouri, the St. Louis City Schools. Uh, when it came to the scope of the audit, uh, we, we always look at financial condition in any audit we do, so that's the first finding. But we also listen to what other people have to say about what needs to be audited. We have a hotline. People report to that. In this particular case, some of the elected members of the elected school board, like Bill Haas, who's in the audience and others, had very specific concerns which were important to us, and we took those into consideration. Some of you members of the media exposed certain areas that we thought needed uh, further analysis. Uh, and then there were some studies that came out uh, that were well publicized about testing irregularities and like that also contributed to the scope. Our office goes in, we do an entrance interview, we talk to people from the outside and the inside, and then we decide the scope of the audit. And that's how we determine the issues that you'll hear me talking about uh, today. Um, the rating that we gave the St. Louis City Schools was a fair on our system of excellent, good, fair, or poor. Uh, it's the identical rating we gave to the Rockwood School District uh, just a few weeks ago, but for very different reasons. Um, I will say, and I will say at the outset, uh, that I know the St. Louis City Schools have, have been almost under siege with a lot of bad news lately. They've got a very challenging task ahead of them, uh, and our objective in, in, in doing the audit and in releasing the audit is entirely constructive. That said, I will point out that the school district itself was not always entirely cooperative with the audit. And that is really the opposite of what we experienced in Rockwood, where the district was highly cooperative. Uh, when we started the audit, we got a letter saying we didn't have the legal authority to do the audit. Uh, we got over that. It was not based on any sound legal principles that we could, we could tell. And all the way at the very end, there was resistance to providing draft copies of the audit to certain people. Uh, I think it's very important as I go through these findings that my office, which will come back in 90 days and do a follow-up audit, work very closely with the district and that the that the things we're talking about today be taken in the constructive spirit that they're offered. These are important things that need to be changed in the school district, and we're hopeful that there will be a somewhat more cooperative attitude from the district uh, afterwards. That said, I wanted to uh, start off first with our first finding uh, in the audit report rel is relative to the financial condition of the district. Uh, as you know, the district uh, engaged in deficit spending from the year 2003 to 2010. Uh, was $55 million in debt in 2010, and then made uh, some significant improvements in their financial condition in 2011 through cost cutting, school closures, things that were really serious efforts to bring the costs under control, and finally showed a surplus uh, in 2011. And we thought that was a very good uh, result. Uh, however, there were still $55 million in debt, and the school district used money it received uh, from the desegregation settlement with the state in order to wipe out almost all of its debt. Uh, which was a good thing, and then provide additional funding to such things as transportation of students, uh, teacher support, information technology, leadership for principals, parent infant programs, and 25 childhood early assessment classrooms, which was $15.9 million per year. Unfortunately, that desegregation settlement 
ends in 2014. There may be a little bit of additional money, we understand, but the basic monies will stop coming in. And our concern about the financial condition of the district is that there's been heavy reliance on this funding that's really one-time funding, and what happens when it goes away? Uh, the response we got from the district was uh, that there may be a voter-approved tax increase, possibly a bond issue. Uh, these are unreliable contingencies, unreliable uh, bases to plan for the future. Uh, and we're hopeful that working with the district, we can see more concrete plans to deal with the fact that an important source of funding will dry up and there is still a risk of going back into the deficit situation. Now, this is not one of our most adverse findings. We are very pleased with the cost cutting we've seen over the past few years. Uh, we just know that has to continue. Uh, and it's always true when you rely on a single source of funding that's going to run out, you've got to figure out what to do with all the programs that we're, that we're relying on that funding and some very important programs we're relying on the funding. And uh, we're not 100 percent confident the district has a plan to deal uh, with the cessation of that funding and we don't want to see it going back into a deficit situation. The second area is a, a more serious finding we had. It's relative to student promotion. Uh, we believe that the promotion of students that's going on right now in the St. Louis City Schools in some respects is violating state law. Uh, if you look at section 167, 645 of the revised Missouri statutes, that's often referred to in jargon as uh, SB 390, Senate Bill 319. Uh, it deals with the promotion of uh, reading requirements and promotion relative to reading requirements. Uh, what we found was 1,800 third and fourth graders were administered a test in 2011. 749 were identified as at risk. Of those 749, only 372 attended summer school. That means 377 did not attend summer school. Uh, those who went into summer school, 91 of those students improved. Uh, and yet, of the 749 identified as at risk, 747 were allowed to go on to the next grade. Uh, even the 377 who didn't go to the summer school. The district's own accountability office believed this was a violation of Senate Bill 319 and the promotion requirements, and we concur with that, that it is a violation. Uh, there's another law that came into effect as well that hasn't been uh, fully uh, discussed, and that's effective 2007 uh, RSMO 162.11006, that's another statute, says that unaccredited, and it also applies to provisionally accredited districts, cannot promote students who read at least one grade level below their current grade. And yet, the vast majority of 2,000 students who rated below basic in communications uh, from grades one to eight were promoted. Uh, we also believe this is a violation of state law. The new district policy calls for holding back only fourth graders reading at least one grade below grade levels, but this statute I just cited applies to all grade levels, not just fourth graders, and we find this very, very problematic. Um, when we talked to people in the district about why there is this noncompliance with state law, we got a response that we felt was unsatisfactory. It may reflect some of the realities of education in the city today, but basically they admitted noncompliance. Uh, they said they weren't in, quote, full compliance, but they really are very far from it. And one administrator, and it's cited in the, uh, in the report, said we just don't have the resources to follow this law. Uh, it would put undue financial hardship on the district to comply with these requirements for promotion. Well, I don't know what the priorities are as far as finances go, but at least in our view, uh, students who can't read should be the highest financial priority. And saying that we don't have enough money to do it or comply with the law and we're going to go ahead and promote students who don't meet the basic reading requirements and who are totally at risk uh, is not the right answer. So we're hopeful that we'll be able to work with the district to come out with a better way to address this very, very serious issue. Uh, our next finding re is relative to monitoring of educational programs. St. Louis City Schools have over a thousand miscellaneous educational programs. These are, these are things called like Focus Friday, cross-curricular writing, tech education tutors, various programs that help students in various ways on, across the board from becoming computer literate to working better with parents, those types of activities. We found that there were very inconsistent and outdated policies governing these programs. In our audit, the district could not even identify all of the programs and does not even know of some of the programs, the central district administration. Um, part of that, we think, is due to the fact that the district cut its accountability office from eight to two people. Uh, I've dealt with budget cuts, too. We're an accountability organization. It's harder to do your job when you don't have as many people as you used to. You try to find ways to do it, but cutting from eight to two leaves only two people to really evaluate the efficacy of these programs, and we find that very problematic. Uh, in 2010, 
uh, and a couple of others, we found in general about 10 program evaluations a year are done. Now, that varies, but about 10. That's 1%. It would take 100 years to evaluate all the programs at that level. That's not an effective level of program evaluation. Uh, there is no central repository for program evaluation forms and, and, and reports, despite a district policy requiring one. And there's no guidance on when you continue or terminate a program. I saw that uh, the mayor's assistant on education was quoted in one of the papers today saying, you know, programs come and they go and there's no continuity. Well, that's exactly right. That's what we're seeing in our audit as well. Uh, there needs to be clear criteria for evaluating programs. They need to know about the programs. They need to know if they're working. And if they're working, there needs to be continued sources of funding, which is all in jeopardy right now, the way these programs are run and the poor record keeping that occurs. Um, we looked at the accountability plan and we found it was very good. Uh, we are not experts in education, but we are experts in process. And it listed all the right things. The accountability plan relates to student performance, staff qualification, instructional resources, parent involvement, all the things you want in an accountability plan. And uh, by the end of fiscal year 2012, which is the year we did the audit for, uh, 48 of 117 action steps had allegedly been completed. And that's good progress. I mean, it's getting up to close to half of the requirements of the accountability plan. The problem we found was that the scorecards submitted by those charged with reporting on whether the action items have been completed were not complete. Uh, sometimes they were late. And it called into question the accuracy of whether those 48 steps had really been met. And we have more about that in the audit. Um, the district response, again, we thought was insufficient. It said there are a multitude of in initiatives. Some of them are not programs, but they qualify them as activities. And if they qualify them as an activity instead of a program, they don't need so much monitoring. It sounds to me kind of like, quite frankly, legal mumbo jumbo. Uh, I mean, what difference between a program and an activity doesn't seem to be material to me. Uh, and uh, I don't agree with the idea that you don't need to monitor it if it only is an activity. I think an activity is something that's specific to a one or two schools and a program is something that's district wide or there's some definition like that. But don't, I mean, our, my feeling is if you have it, if there's resources going to it, it ought to be monitored and scorecards ought to be accurate on those programs. Um, there was also a statement that a lot of these activities have very small impact on achievement. Well, if they only have a small impact on achievement, then they shouldn't have the program and the money should go uh, somewhere else. Um, when we talked about the problems with accountability plan performance data, you can see the response was that that's due to staff changes and shifts. Again, we feel that's an inadequate response uh, to the problem. I want to talk a little bit about the map testing. Uh, there was some, I guess, a little bit of misinformation that this was the entire focus of the audit. It wasn't, but we did look at the issue. And it's important to know that as auditors, we're not experts on cheating. So we don't go in and see if somebody's cheating or not. What we look at is are there procedures in place to ensure there isn't cheating? That's what we look at. And that's what we looked at at the audit. Uh, as a follow-up to MAT testing, there was uh, new mo monitoring procedures put up in place in 2012. Uh, they sent out 400, uh, they sent out several, I don't know the exact number of monitors, but they were supposed to produce 400 monitoring sheets. Some of them did more than one. So I don't know the total number of monitors, but we were expecting about 400 monitoring sheets back on the test. When we asked for those 400 sheets, we found 100 were missing, 25%. Uh, there were both monitors that were at school employees, and there were a few outside monitors as well. Uh, we asked that the district try to locate the 100 missing monitoring forms. Uh, and some of these people, by the way, were paid, uh, and they didn't submit their forms. Uh, and they got some of them back, and we were pleased about that, but obviously that data had not initially gone into determining whether there were irregularities because they were missing. But still, even after a concerted effort to get the forms from the monitors who had not submitted them, we found that they could not get any forms for three schools uh, and an insufficient number to provide reliable data from another 12 schools. Uh, we also found that the district, while it does disseminate information about testing irregularities, DESE gets it, the schools get it, what was lacking, and this is what auditors look for, were, were specific processes for investigations into large fluctuations. If test scores go up dramatically one year, there ought to be, okay, here's what you need to do now. You start an investigation, here's how it's run, here's what the results are. Those types of things were missing uh, in the district's procedures. Uh, the response we got was, Independent quality assurance monitors or supplementary district employees, you know, they were still being paid $28 an hour. They should have done their job. Uh, on MAP test fluctuations, the district has a very long response about what they do and how the data is disseminated, but it does not address why there are no procedures defining a significant fluctuation, no documentation of any investigations into significant testing fluctuation, or what the guidance is for when you have to start an investigation. So there are improved procedures in place, but they need to make sure the monitors are submitting the data 
They need to take the data and they need to notify schools when you need to do an investigation. They need to tell them how to do that investigation so that it's uniform across the district. And then if there really are irregularities, uh, there needs to be a very thorough investigation as to whether there was any sort of criminal activity that occurred. Next is the area of procurement and contracting. The district has a requirement for competitive bidding uh, of over $5,000, any contract that's going to be worth over $5,000, unless there's an emergency. So for example, if there's a flood, you don't have to go out and get bids, you get somebody to clean up the flood quickly. We understand that. And there are circumstances in which competitive bidding should not occur. But what we found is they've used the same busing vendor for nine years. It's a $24 million contract. While they renegotiate with that contractor, there's never been an attempt to competitively bid the contract in nine years. We also found the following purchases of over $5,000 for which there was no competition. Textbooks, musical instruments, maintenance, and several other areas. In the services area, grant writing, temporary services, legal lobbying services uh, also had not been competed out. The rules are more flexible there. But I found that competition helps. I was a lawyer in private practice before I became uh, your state auditor, and I competed for every case I got. Even for a client I had won 20 cases for. We always competed, kept our prices down. We think it's an important uh, part of the process. In construction contracts, um, we find a lot of construction contract problems with school districts. In Rockwood, as you know, it was conflicts of interest that were the problem. We did not find that here. But what we found is often there's only one bidder for construction contracts. That was true on tuck pointing contracts, renovation contracts, uh, electrical contracts, demolition contracts, and our, our, we look at con uh, con contracting across the whole state. We see it in every state agency, board, commission, school district, and when we find only one bidder, something's wrong with the RFP process, the request for proposal process. So we ask that in those cases where they can only get one bidder, even if multiple bidders express interest at the outset when initial conferences were occurred, there's something wrong with the process if only one company bids all the time. And we're asking them to take a look at that and find ways to improve it so that there's greater competition in those cases where there's only one bidder. Sunshine Law. Um, we found in some cases untimely preparation of meeting minutes. We found items that were approved in closed session that were often not announced publicly as is required by state law. And we found some meetings were improperly closed, closed for purposes that are not allowed under the state Sunshine Law. Patrick Henry follow-up. As you may know, one of the very first audits I did as state auditor was investigate the allegations that there was attendance inflation at a particular school in St. Louis, Patrick Henry. We had received complaints from teachers and administrators about it. We went in, we did a rapid response because there were allegations that documents were being destroyed and that's the only time I activate the rapid response team is when there are allegations that documents are being destroyed. We found that a lot of documents actually had been destroyed, but when we compared the manual attendance forms with the computerized attendance forms, there were huge discrepancies that could only be explained with attendance inflation. And that was supplemented by sworn affidavits of teachers and an administrator that there was deliberate attendance inflation going on. The individual charged was dis uh, with the, the or, or about whom the charges were made was dismissed, and there was some action taken, which we appreciate to make sure that this type of activity does not go on uh, in the future in other other schools. Uh, however, we also recommended that you tr that there be adjustments to the attendance made, that accurate attendance be there, because it's not only important for reporting accurate attendance in the schools, but it also affects the funding of the school. And the response we got, again, was problematic. The response we got was, well, if we'd gone through all the trouble to adjust the attendance, the maximum impact it would have had would have been $145,000, and that's not material. I don't think that's an acceptable response. And we're hopeful that they'll go back and revise that as well. Finally, uh, the district has an independent auditor. The auditor doesn't do the kinds of audits we do, which are called performance audits, which are wide ranging. They focus mostly on finances. But the, in, the independent auditor of the school district has made recommendations for many years that have not been implemented yet. They're basic things, uh, better pre preparation of financial statements, better records of capital assets, improved data security, uh, and also it's been recommended that there be an internal audit function in the city schools. This was the same recommendation I made in Springfield, and they did go ahead and provide an internal audit uh, function. Uh, keep in mind, this school district, we perceive it, of it as it should be, as an educational uh, district as something that's designed to help our children, but it's also a $370 million a year business. 
and I don't know of many $370 million a year businesses that don't have an internal audit function to do the things that we can't do. I can't come in every year. I've got to do 150 audits a year. I've got a small staff. I do every state agency, board, commission, school district. I can't come in and do it all the time. Your independent auditor can only come in once a year. Having continuous monitoring is the best way to make sure that fiscal resources are properly spent, and we hope that the school district will consider putting in an internal audit function. I believe that it will cost a little money to have an internal audit function, but the cost savings that will be realized will much more than offset uh, the amount of money it costs to have that function. That is a very brief summary of what we found in our audit. There's a lot more detail in the audit. I'm happy to have Bob MacArthur and Mark Reether, who were really did an excellent job, very intensive job of working with the district on this audit. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions, or if I can't, they will be happy to answer them for you.